Good morning. Good to be with you again. Summer after my freshman year of college, I had the opportunity to go with a few friends over to southern India and to spend a couple weeks there. Uh, we got to visit a, a, an Indian pastor there and to learn a little bit about what ministry looked like on that side of the world. And, and most of our time was spent over there in this large city called Chennai. Uh, it's a pretty big one, a city of about six and a half million people, and, and it just feels it's really closed in, feels like people are kind of on top of each other, but, but there were a few days where we had an opportunity to go about five hours outside of the city into this rural region of India. And while we were there, we got to do a few different things. We had the opportunity to go uh, visit this uh, small little college for men and women who were preparing themselves to do ministry there in India. We had a chance to go worship in uh, some small little village churches, like literally made out of mud and straw, these thatch roofs and all of those things, and to sit there and worship alongside some brothers and sisters in those churches, which was really cool. We also had the opportunity while we were there to visit a small leprosy hospital. Leprosy, the, the, the disease that we describe when we use that word today, the, the kind of official name for it is Hansen's disease. And, and it's a bacterial infection that begins to attack the skin and the nerves and the eyes and the nasal passages. But much of the damage is done by attacking the nerves. It can cause, through this attack, it can cause paralysis in different parts of people's bodies. And one of the major things it does is it, it uh, kills the ability to sense pain. And so what often happens out in these parts of the world where there's not much access to medical care or, or where there's not much access to, to good hygiene, to clean water and those kinds of things is a person will get leprosy and, and they'll cut themselves. Maybe they'll get a cut on their foot or somewhere and they don't know that they've done that because they can't feel it. And so they may go for some time with that and they don't treat it properly and so it begins to get infected and sometimes gangrene sets in and they'll begin to actually uh, lose fingers and toes to this or lose parts even like their nose and, and become disfigured in those things. And so we walked through this hospital and then honestly saw some things that were pretty difficult to see. But I also heard some things that were surprising to me. For example, one of the things that I was told is that medically speaking, Leprosy is not a big deal. It's not really a problem to deal with medically. All you have to do, actually, if you have leprosy, is take like a series of antibiotics. And once you take those antibiotics, you will be cured like 100%. Do I need to go to this? Okay, I'm going to stick with this for just a second. If it gets too much, guys, I'll move to the mic. So I'm going to try this just a little longer. Um, if you take these rounds of antibiotics for just a few months, you will be cured completely. The biggest issue in curing leprosy is not that we don't have the treatment for it. The biggest issue is that they cannot get people to come forward and receive treatment because there's such a stigma around this disease. People are afraid of getting it themselves, and so they don't want to be around someone who has it. And it's also thought in many parts of the world that if you have leprosy, you're under some sort of curse from the gods, or that maybe you've, uh, you've got some sort of incredibly dark sin in your life, and that's why you have those things. And so if it's discovered that you have leprosy, you may be shunned from society, from the people around you. So if people think they have it, rather than go forward and get any sort of treatment, they try their best to kind of hide it and keep it hidden, keep it to themselves. In the Gospel of Mark, the very first chapter, there's this story told where Jesus is walking in the region of Galilee and this man comes up to him. The man is covered in leprosy. And Mark doesn't tell us in the text what everyone's reaction is around Jesus at this time, but we don't really have to guess. We have a pretty good idea because the stigma surrounding leprosy back then was just as great, if not worse, even more than it is today. To have leprosy, which was a description of any kind of skin disease, really, was, was to make you unclean, which means that you were not allowed to participate in the communal or the religious life of the culture of the people around you. 
And anyone that you came into contact with, they were now deemed unclean, which means nobody wanted you around. You were not allowed to live within city limits. You had to go and live outside in, in some sort of tent or dwelling out there until you were clean, if you ever got clean. And, and you were not allowed to be around your friends anymore. And you couldn't really be with your family. And you couldn't go to the synagogue and learn the scriptures. And you couldn't go to the temple and worship and offer sacrifices. You couldn't probably have a job because who's going to buy anything from you or let you work for them? To be a leper was to be on the absolute farthest margins of society. And so when this man comes forward to see Jesus, more than likely everyone else around would have jumped back, would have, would have covered their faces. Some of them might have even started shouting at him, what are you doing here? How dare you risk all of us, all of our lives with your uncleanness in this place? But the man, if he cared, he doesn't show it. He's only there for one person anyway. He's not there for the rest of them. He's there because he's heard, he's heard the rumors that this man, this Jesus of Nazareth, might have the ability, might have the power to heal him and give him his life back. And so he goes, and Mark says that he falls on his knees in front of Jesus and says, Jesus, if you are willing, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Mark uses this really interesting word to describe Jesus in this moment. Remember, it would have been written in Greek originally. The word that he uses for Jesus is splachnizomai. And it's, it's really interesting because it means to be like moved from the gut is literally what it means, like from the intestines. The idea that Mark is getting across is that something wells up from the very core of Jesus' being wells up towards this man. The way we translate it is that he was moved with or that he was filled with compassion for this man. And he looks him in the eye and he says, I am willing. And he reaches out and touches him. And in that moment, the man is completely restored. This word, splachnizomai, it doesn't come up very often in the Bible, but, but almost every time it does, it's referring to Jesus. Luke uses this word like this one time when Jesus is walking near a village called Nain. And as he's coming to the village, there's this funeral procession that is coming out of the village. It's this widow who's just lost her only son. He's died and they're having this funeral. And as they're walking out, this woman is falling apart. And Jesus sees it and he just, he can't help himself. He, he's moved from deep inside of him and he goes over and he just shuts the whole funeral procession down. And he raises the boy back to life and gives him back to his mom. Matthew uses this very word to describe a time when Jesus is walking past Jericho and there's this large crowd following him and there's these two blind men on the side of the road and they can't see but they hear the commotion and they ask what's going on. Someone tells them Jesus is coming. And so they just start shouting, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And it's loud and it's annoying and people are getting angry and they're telling them to shut up but Jesus stops in the middle of his tracks, and filled with compassion, he moves over to these two men and heals both of them right there. Matthew used the word in chapter 9 when Jesus looks out over this crowd that's following him, and he can see it. He knows it. He sees it in their faces, that they're beaten down, that they're worn out, and he's full of compassion for them, and he teaches them, and he heals them, and he feeds them. This is just who Jesus is, when he sees pain, when he sees brokenness or fallenness, he just naturally moves towards it. And everywhere he went, he did these things. He moved towards brokenness in love, towards outsiders and towards sinners, towards the people that everyone else recoils from. And of course, the most visible expression of this, this love and compassion that is so naturally apparent in Jesus, the most visible expression comes at the very end of his ministry when he moves himself up onto the cross to heal all of our brokenness. One of my favorite verses in all the, all the scriptures, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still broken, while we were still messed up, when we did not have our act together, when everyone else would recoil from us, Jesus moved towards us and he died for us. And Paul will go on to say just a couple verses later, it's not, it's worse than that. We weren't just sinners. We were God's enemies. We were against him. We were rebelling and trying to take control for ourselves. And he still loved us enough to come for us, which means this, 
that if you are in this room today, and after you've heard all of these things, you still find yourself thinking that Jesus is not for you because your sin is too ugly. Because you've got a past that if people knew about it, it would make them cringe. Because you have maybe a present that your life right now, if people really knew the truth about you, would make people cringe. And you think that Jesus would do the same thing. I want you to know the Bible vehemently disagrees with you. That you are exactly the kind of person that Jesus came for. He comes and he moves towards brokenness and sin and ugliness in love. And he doesn't come to you and say, oh, it's fine the way you're living. It's fine the way you are. I'm just going to let you be like that. No. He doesn't leave us like that. That would be the least loving thing he could do. He came to rescue you from all that, to bring you to himself. It's just in his nature as the son of God. His love is like water that always flows down to the lowest places. And thank God that that includes you and I. That it has reached all the way down to us, regardless of how low we are in life, regardless of how bad we've been, regardless of how dirty or unclean we are, his love always makes it down to the lowest places. But here's the thing. Jesus does not intend that love to stop with you. Just as he has moved towards you in your brokenness, he now wants to move towards others through you. And if it's true that Jesus' love is like water that always reaches its way down to the darkest places, and if it's already made its way down and reached us, then there's a choice that you and I have. Will we be like a bucket, or will we be like a conduit, like a pipe? Both of those things receive water. A bucket receives water and takes it in and then it holds it and contains it and keeps it to itself. A conduit, on the other hand, receives water, but then it lets that water flow through it and it takes that water to other places. So we have this choice. Which one will we be like? Actually, I say we have a choice. In some ways, we don't some ways we really don't, and that's because of that story that we just heard on the screen just a minute ago from Matthew 25, the story that Jesus tells. He says that when he returns and comes to this earth one day, he's going to take everyone on the earth, and he's going to divide them into these two groups. And he's going to take this group called the sheep on his right, and he's going to take a group of people and put them on the left, and he's going to call them the goats. And then he's going to say these words, and this is from Matthew 25 starting in verse 34, says, Then the king, that's Jesus, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And the story goes that when Jesus says this to all the sheep, they all look at him and go, we don't remember any of that. Jesus, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you naked and clothe you? We don't remember any of that. And, and then Jesus replies to them in verse 40, the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You did this to me when you were doing it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters. The least of these, he's referring to, like other brothers and sisters in Christ, Christians who are, who are poor and destitute, who are persecuted, who are broken, who are downtrodden, those who are considered unimportant, who are disregarded by the rest of the world. It says when we love those people, when we love those people well, we're loving Jesus. And then he'll take this other group on his left, the goats, and he'll say everything opposite. Depart from me. You will go into judgment because you did not care for me in my need. You did not take care of me when I was hungry or sick or thirsty. And they'll say the same, when did we see you like that? Jesus will say, you saw me like that when you saw the least of these. And you refused to care for them. Now this can sound a little bit confusing at first, right? Because it almost sounds like Jesus is saying that we get into heaven by our good deeds. Like if I'm kind and compassionate toward the poor and the broken and the hurting and if I do that enough then I can get into heaven but if I don't then I go to hell and those kinds of things and how does that work is that what Jesus is saying I don't think so because if that was really the case then there would be no need for Jesus to die for us Jesus did die for us it's by his blood it's by his grace 
that I am saved and made worthy and acceptable to be able to go into heaven. But I think what Jesus is trying to get at here is that if a person truly has been saved by Jesus, if they really have experienced the love of Jesus and they've responded to that love in faith and given their life to him in baptism and those things, if that's really happened, if his spirit is really residing in me, then I'm going to start living with the same kind of love and kindness that Jesus has. This is what Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If Christ lives in me, if that's true, then his love is going to begin flowing from me to the lost and the hurting. There's the two categories right there for just a moment to think about. The lost and the hurting. There are people in your life right now that fit in those two categories people that desperately need to experience the grace and compassion of Jesus Christ. And I hope for just a moment that the Holy Spirit will begin to bring names and faces to your mind as we talk for just a second. There are people around you in your life who are lost, people who have been separated from God by their sin and they need to know about the love of Jesus that redeems them back, that can bring them to him. They may be people you know well. It may be a family member that's going through your mind right now. It might be a close personal friend or it might be someone that you just know a little bit, an acquaintance, someone you're in band with or someone that you're on a soccer team with or those kinds of things. Whoever they are, they are desperately in need of the love of Jesus. So here's the question. What will it look like for them to experience that love through you? There are also people in your life who are hurting right now. People who are going through very difficult things. People who are isolated and lonely. The kind of people that others always tend to withdraw from. And so you may or may not be close to them. They may be other brothers and sisters in Christ. They may be here with you this week as a part of your youth group. There are people who are desperately in need of the compassion of Jesus. So, what will it look like for them to see that compassion in you this week? You may be thinking, Drew, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I don't know how to. I'm not good at talking to people. I, I don't know how to share my faith. I don't, I don't have, like, the training to help hurting people. That's okay. You don't have to have it all figured out just yet. All I'm asking is what is one simple step, one simple thing you could do right now to show somebody the love of Jesus. And then you can ask God what's next after that and see what comes next, but just what's one thing? Now, you might be thinking, Drew, the name that's going through my mind right now, the face that's going through my mind right now, I don't want to love that person. I don't feel a lot of compassion for that person because they're rude and they're difficult and they're hard to be around. That's okay. Even if you don't feel compassion towards them, Jesus does. And he can use you anyway. A lot of times, love actually means showing kindness and compassion to people before we feel it. And if Jesus has done that for us, if Jesus showed us that kind of love before we deserved it, then we are called to do the same. So I'm walking through this hospital with my friends in India. And at one point, we're led into this room, and there's this patient there, and he's laying in a bed, and, and he's got some form of leprosy that's begun to attack his foot. It's begun to eat away at the flesh all around his foot, and it's not pretty. There's this guy that's in there with him, this guy that's like working with him and taking care of him. I don't think he's a nurse. He, he didn't seem to be a nurse, just a volunteer or some kind of worker there in the hospital who's with this patient, and he's cleaning his wounds, and he's giving him medication, and he's caring for them. And, and I've got this thought going through my mind, what would compel a person? to come and work in a place like this where you're surrounded by so much, so much difficult things. But not just that, in this culture specifically where there's so much fear and stigma around this disease, what compels a person to come work in a place like this? One of us must have asked the question. We couldn't speak the language, but there was a translator there. One of us must have asked the question because the man actually began telling us and explaining I didn't speak his language, as I said, but before his answer was even translated to me, I knew what he was saying. Because as he spoke, he held up a, f a hand to reveal two missing fingers, a sign of his own bout with leprosy. 
And the answer he gave us was essentially this, the reason I'm here, the reason I'm in this room right now is because that used to be me. I used to be the man in the bed. I was the leper, and someone was kind enough to help me, and so now I want to do the same for others. Brothers and sisters, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you have been saved by him, that's you. That's me. We were the lepers. We were the ones that could not be touched. We were the ones who were broken and in need of healing, and Jesus had love on us, and Jesus had compassion on us, and he healed us of all our brokenness. And so now the question is for us, now that we have received that kind of love and compassion from him, will we keep that all to ourselves, or will we give that love and compassion to others? See you tomorrow.